Hello, everyone. Welcome. It's a pleasure to restart again the, the presential uh, lectures at the Josep Carreras Research Institute uh, in a hybrid manner, uh, in a presential manner here in the, in the hall. I'm very happy to see masked faces in the auditorium and also uh, using the online platform. We have the pleasure today of having with us uh, Professor Andres Hidalgo. Andres graduated in Biological Science in the Autonomous University of Madrid. Uh, he completed his PhD there at the Centro de Investigaciones Biológicas, already starting hematopoietic adhesion. And from there, he moved to the lab of the late uh, Dr. Paul uh, Frenet at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York. After a very successful postdoc, he moved back to Spain, becoming a junior group leader at the Spanish National Cardiovascular Research Center in Madrid, where he has been uh, fostering his career until becoming the, the, the group leader of the imaging and cardiovascular inflammation and immune response. His research has always been devoted to the study of the cellular and molecular mechanisms involved in innate immune cells, hematopoietic precursors, and the, and the physiology and pathology of all these cells and tissues. He has, he's an expert also in life imaging. You'll see probably very nice pictures in, during his lecture. And using this life imaging and other molecular technologies, he has been able to decipher the function of uh, innate, innate immune cells. And also uh, lately about the activity of tissue resident macrophages. He's here for his excellent work, um, many publications and recognitions that I'm not going to, to detail. And the title of his talk is Immune Trafficking and the Bone Marrow. Andres? Thanks, um, Manuel, for the invitation. Thanks, everyone, for being here. It's it's um, exciting to be giving a lecture that is not talking to a screen, it's talking to people. And I, I hope for you it's also exciting to see someone <laughs> just moving around in the stage. Uh, so it's great, and also to to get to know the um, the, the the new institute, which is is fantastic. I haven't been able to see around, but the uh, location, the mountain, and I want to come here. This is lovely. Plus the plus the sea. We don't have a sea in Madrid. Right? So um, yes, as Manel mentioned, we I'm uh, the lab. We do mostly uh, immunology, but um, uh, while working with Paul, certainly we got a lot of interest in in the bone marrow and hematopoiesis, which is the link with what most of you do here. We don't do malignant hematopoiesis, um, but we always keep an eye on on this connection, and we're more and more i would say immune but the good thing of studying the immune system is that uh, when you study um, uh, immunology and inflammation basically you study all sort of biology because uh, it's more and more appreciated that, that immune cells neutrophils macrophages of course the lymphocytes they're everywhere and they contribute and regulate uh, a lot of things including things in the bone marrow which is where hematopoietic cells and uh, good and bad originate so i think this is um relevant um also for the mission of this institute. Um, so I uh, just wanted to start. I always talk too much, so I wanted to make sure that I recognize the people from the lab. This is the Ethnic Campus, uh, one um, not online picnic, actual picnic with masks. Um, and uh, the work that I'm going to uh, tell you about is mostly um, from Ithier Cosio, it's actually from here, from Barcelona. And, and Kanako Wakahashi, she's not from Barcelona, she's from Japan. Uh, but really a, a team effort. Um, and I also wanted to um, to use this excuse to, uh, um, Manel mentioned this, to, to give a, uh, a bit of a memory to Paul Frenet, who was my mentor for many years uh, and who just uh, recently passed away very sadly of, uh, of, out of a, a very acute and, and, and nasty uh, angiosarcoma. And, and he was a great mentor and, and a good friend. So. I think for the field of hematology is, is always um, important to keep uh, in mind the people who came before us. But it's also pertinent uh, for the seminar because I wanted to start with uh, a citation of one of his papers. One of the, of the, I would say it's the second seminal paper from his lab from the early 2000s, where he reported that uh, hematopoietic stem cells are released spontaneously following circadian oscillations. And I want to make also the point of a, an interesting fun fact um, that this was the, the whole paper who was published in Nature and it's been cited many, many times. I uh, came out of a serendipitous observation 
um, from from Mikel actually. Uh, it's an Italian postdoc and he had the bad luck like, of doing um, mobilization of stem cells, uh, you know, for transplantation therapy. This was one of the projects in the lab. Um, one of the rooms, and you know that the rooms always, you know, they have like that circles. Uh, when you read the methods, a libidum feeding, um, SPF. Well, so the uh, light night circles are, are uh, important. And in this case, the room went in constant light. And this significantly altered the number of colony forming units in culture. So basically progenitors that go into the circulation and also uh, LSK cells. So the observation was in the end that there was something in the bone marrow that was sensitive to light, which was uh, maybe is more accepting about it. it was kind of crazy at the time that you have hematopoiesis pump and there's some sort of neural regulation stemming from this, which was not, again, might seem obvious now, um, but it was not at the time. And with this came a whole um, idea that has been exploited quite a bit that the bone marrow, like many other systems, is sensitive to neural inputs, uh, and it's, in this case, controlled by circadian oscillations, and that they were nerves, and uh, just like, like stress induces changes in the bone marrow, and this has led actually uh, to a very um, uh, a strong feel of inflammation, pathogenic inflammation, being controlled. Um, by the by the uh, central nervous system. So this came with this, but also started an interest in everybody in the lab about the circadian oscillations. Uh, you know, what are these things? And also with the idea, the, the other question is why the hell are there uh, uh, hematopoietic stem cells in the circulation and the steady state conditions? You know, these, these stem cells are, are super happy and Lenson had a, a beautiful paper a few years ago showing that this is the best place for long leaf cells to be because they're just protected from any sort of um, external damage. Um, but this is an observation that was made uh, over um, 50 years ago, almost 60 years ago by Goodman and Hudson, uh, you know, with uh, evidences at the time that they were proliferating and repopulating uh, uh, um, stem cells in the circulation of, of rats and mice. Um, and then about 40 years later, uh, Erf Weisman um, demonstrated uh, using a different model of parabiosis. I will show you some of these, uh, that this, uh, this uh, activity could be transferred from one mouse to another. And then um, Paul's paper about um, uh, five to so seven uh, years later, showing that this release was not a casual, that it followed specific instructions for the, from the central nervous system. So a lot of uh, interesting observations. Um, you know, you might think that this is relevant or not to your research, but certainly it, it tells you something about the physiology of things. That is what, what we try to understand in the lab. How does this work? And is this broken in, in disease in any way? And what can we learn from this? And this is uh, a bit our approach. Um, so the question is not only uh, the observation that they're there, the question is what really is the function of these circulating hematopoietic stem cells? And this is something that we'll be uh, talking about a little bit. And there, basically, this nobody can tell you a definitive answer, but the prevailing idea so far is um, that they might be recirculating, sort of like um, a, a scouting different organs for the presence of pathogens so they can expand uh, locally. So this in normal conditions, so supposedly this would serve an immune function, but this can, of course, be also um, detrimental. Uh, and there's this beautiful paper by Matthias Narendorf a few years ago showing that the stress associated with myocardial infarction, same signaling that light induces, in this case, uh, um, uh, stress, psychological stress or physical stress associated with infarction, uh, induces uh, adrenergic signaling that hits the bone marrow, and this releases um, stem and progenitor cells, in this case, through the uh, a, a stage in the spleen, and these cells uh, expand, become more inflammatory, and actually contribute to uh, um, a, a exaggerating the inflammatory response of the arteries and induce more, um, uh, the likelihood of a second infarction becomes bigger. So this is just a, a, a fit for mechanism that is vicious and, and nasty, and this in the end associated with, with this um, um, phenomenon of stem cells being released uh, into the circulation. So what are um, um, circadian oscillations? I like to use this slide that we made to make the point that circadian oscillations in general and particularly immunity are the result of adaptation of life to the environment. 
if the environment was constant and uh, you know for those the, for those um how do you call them the, the planistas the one that, that think that, that the earth is flat you could tell them that circadian oscillations are a refute of their of their hypothesis um, so anyway because the the environment changes in our case because there's rotation and different exposure to to light uh, changes in temperature, access to food, everything basically changes in a in a very predictable way every 12 hours. Then biology just adapts to this environment. So you know, adaptation is is a, is a, is a key feature of biological systems. So when the system changes, there's these cell intrinsic programs or organism intrinsic programs that predict the changes that will occur and prepare the organism in terms of metabolism, immunity, hematology, anything, any system that you can think of uh, changes to adapt to the new, um, to the, to these new changes. So this is, this is the idea. And this is where, where we picked up uh, quite a few years ago when I was setting up the lab and, and Maria Casanova was um, starting her PhD and we started with the circadian experiments. She was always complaining that, you know, doing 24 hours in the lab was not fun. Uh, I agree, but then when we published the paper, she wasn't that complaining. So I think there's a lot of um, benefits in, in, in designing your system in the way that you can get the real answer that you want to get. Uh, so anyway, uh, we were interested in neutrophils because I had been studying inflammation with Paul and I just thought this was a really understudied cell that we could learn a lot from it. Um, and the only point I want to make is just by looking at very simple phenotypic markers, we could see a circadian trend. These are, as I give her times, every four hours we just take blood from an otherwise healthy animal. So we don't do anything. We just wait and take samples. And we see that there are these spontaneous changes, uh, not only in the number of, of cells, so this is the total number of cells, but also in the number of these um, L-selecting or C612 um low population which we call uh, age cells so the name is, is not relevant right now um, i just wanted to lay the point that in almost every system including um humble neutrophils their their parents not only in numbers but also in phenotype and this is important because then you know that the biology is not just more or less but also this quality that is that is changing and just to make a brief point um around these, why, why these systems are interesting and, and, and humble neutrophils uh, are controlling more things that we think. Uh, we did a number of studies over the years with Maria and later with Jose Maria Drover um, to show that the cells uh, that seem different with these markers are actually uh, different morphologically and uh, at the transcriptomic level. So this uh, you just do um, RNA sequencing of neutrophils taken at the different time points. You predict this pathway analysis, but actually the prediction was quite good, uh, showing that there is differences in, in the type of inflammatory response, uh, apoptosis, and migration. Um, and the, the, the validation, just to show you how these in silico... Uh, Yes. So that these um, uh, in silico predictions actually transform into real life um, differences. I want to show you, uh, Manel mentioned that we like to do imaging. And, and, and this is a, so, some of the imaging that we do. Uh, so here in this experiment, we managed to put in the same mouse, uh, green cells and red cells these are all neutrophils. We just see some genetic trick that I won't go into details, but anyway, the green cells are what we call the night time cells. So we just managed to put cells that genetically resemble what uh, uh, the neutrophils at night time around CT um, uh, 13 to 17. And the red cells are those that will uh, be more abundant during daytime, for example, at noon, right now, all right, for us. And we just wanted to compare if migration were really was different. So we just induce inflammation. This is blood vessel, and we're looking for the recruitment of the cells. And one thing we realized that we predicted from the experiments that we did is that the green cells, the nighttime-like cells, would be more sticky to the endothelium. Uh, I didn't show the data, but in part because among the changes that you see in the cells, they uh, have more, much, uh, many more microvilli, so the structures um, that might have other purposes, but they are important for addition because a lot of the, the sticky receptors accumulate in the top of these microvilli. So these green cells have more of them, and we wanted to see how this translated in physiology. And you see, 
the, the number of cells was 50, 50 in the circulation, but look how many more green cells are, are rolling on the vessel, how many more, um, of course, later on up here on the vasculature, only one red cell and several green cells. And what we care about most is how many cells ultimately go to the site of inflammation, many more green cells go to the damage area. And this is one example of circadian changes that are associated with, with this transcriptional uh, and, and proteomic, I won't show this, but there are a lot of, the cells basically are different cell types. So they have the same name, they come from the same origin, but they change enough that they're functionally different. And this is what I just mentioned. So the, the first cells are more sticky than the, um, what we call the age cells. This is because these are the cells similar to what uh, leaves the bone marrow and over time they just become like this. That's why we call this process aging. Uh, so uh, another example of why this is relevant if you study infection or, or inflammation uh, is from this experiment. If you do an infection of an animal, but the same observation has been done with, with humans, you know, uh, I have episodes of sepsis, for example. But here you uh, infect with this fungus, um, the animal. If you infect in this particular example, at daytime, the susceptibility or the damage to the organism or the spread of the infection is higher if you, if you do the, the inoculation at daytime, CD5 would be noon, than if you do it at nighttime. And this is just, you don't do anything. This is just the body telling you that there's something that is changing so that the immune response is stronger at nighttime. But now, if you, uh, we managed uh, to find a way to disrupt the molecular clock in neutrophils, we just took one of the core clock um, molecular genes, it's a transcription factor, VML1, from the cells, and then repeat the experiment. So the question was how much of this circadian sensing of inflammation or infection is controlled by the cell rather than the many other things that are in the endothelial cells or if the proteins in the, in the serum, anything. So this is the experiment, and what we found is that if you eliminate the gene exclusively in, in neutrophils, then the circadian difference is, is broken. So this is an example from infection, and this is a similar example. Uh, you know, we are thenic, so every time we can, we, we just look at the heart. So anyway, what matters is that this is ischemia reperfusion, inflammatory injury of the heart. So we do the ischemia, and then after 24 hours, we look how much of the myocardial um, volume is dead and we quantify this as a measure of the degree of inflammation. So like with infection, if you do the, the injury, in this case the opposite, you do the injury at CT5, so at noon, the, the amount of death, myocardial tissue death, um, it's much greater than if you do the experiment at night time. So this is just, what the point I want to make here is that this is a natural program that controls disease. And this is something I think might be relevant for every, every one of you. But now again, if you eliminate VML, one of the same animals as before, it's only in neutrophils, then this difference is basically gone. So um, their, their ideas that come from these uh, relatively simple observations, this idea that there's a cell intrinsic clock that is, in, that is important. Uh, and one of them originates from this, this scheme that we develop with, uh, with uh, with the work of Cosa Maria showing that this, this VMAL, what it does, controls the expression of this chemokine, axis in a, in an autocrine way, hits CXCA2, and this drives this process of physiological or circadian aging. So it's some sort of activation that is controlled by the cell. Uh, but at the same time, we discover uh, doing the, the appropriate genetics that there's another receptor, CXCA4, that senses, instead of an inflammatory chemokine, it senses a homeostatic chemokine, and this is interesting, acts as a negative regulator of this pathway. So what we're doing now with the help of, of like a foundation is try to find ways to hit this receptor with agonists to try to prevent this. So what we're doing is, is just um, not interfere with the whole recruitment or eliminating neutrophils. Nobody wants that because then you would be protected from myocardial infarction but you would die from an infection, so you die in any way. It's better to use a different strategy. In this case, what we thought is we can hit this to just eliminate this, this difference. So this is still a, a baseline level of both inflammation and, and control of infections. We just eliminating the, the extra punch uh, that you get that is controlled by the circadian um, uh, program. And this is what, what we're doing now. And this is, uh, I'm not showing this here, this is what Alejandra PhD student is doing right now in the lab. So anyway, going back to our circadian system and try to get a bit closer to the bone marrow, 
this, these ideas from these from these uh, circadian graphs in the case of neutrophils. Um, one is is that you know uh, they go up and they go down. When they go up, we assume that these cells are leaving the bone marrow at specific times of the day, starting around midnight, and in the morning you're ready to go with with the peak around noon. But once you hit the peak, know that there's a very sharp decrease in about four to eight hours. Basically, all this goes down. In the humans, is is it's quite similar, perhaps not not as abrupt. Um, but consider that this in humans, this implies billions of cells dying every day in, in a healthy um, uh, individual. Um, so we're talking about cells 10 to the 10th, that of course you don't want those cells to die in your circulation. That would be nasty to have a lot of so much necrosis or even apoptosis in the circulation. And there's little evidence that there's apoptosis in the circulation. So there's this clearance program that was a black box, basically. Neutrophils disappear from the circulation. So what happens to them? Nobody knows. Hey, let's assume that they go to the spleen, bone marrow, and, and liver, and they take care of that. It's, uh, there's a lot of these hypotheses if you look in your field. People assume things without any proof, and this was very irritating to me. In this particular case, uh, we wanted to know, you know, if this clearance really was a clearance, or it's just that the cells shifted from the blood into organs, and if they, and they were doing something else in organs, you know, what, what the hell? We're just missing... 50% of the biology of these cells. So this is what we've spent, uh, we've been spending um, quite a bit of time. And I'll just go quickly through this. Uh, I, this is not the point of, of today's seminar. Um, but the point is that when we design this experiment, we use a priority system. So we could see the cells coming exclusively from the circulation. If you study only one mouse, for example, in the bomar, you don't know what is produced there. You don't know what is coming from outside. So we use this system where this is the donor mouse and this is the recipient mouse. So the red cells that we find in this mouse have to be coming from the circulation. And this is a way to study uh, clearance. So this is, we did a lot of imaging, flow cytometry. Basically, we, we spent uh, a few years trying to uh, to uh, address this point. Um, and what we find basically, a bit the, the surprise, is of course, spleen, uh, uh, bone marrow and liver have quite a few cells, but basically, uh, green, in this case, would be neutrophils. Red is more difficult to see, would be the ones coming from the other mouse. So just take my word for this, because uh, in, in some tissues, the numbers are low. Uh, basically, we can find infiltration of neutrophils everywhere, and that, that's the point. The two places where we didn't find this, it was the brain, perhaps not not, not, not surprisingly, and the, and the gonads, uh, two organs that are probably immunoprivileged, and they don't want neutrophils for anything. But all other organs that we looked, and some that are not here, the heart, the pancreas, the kidneys, everything, um, gets to some extent infiltration of neutrophils. And this opened basically uh, for us a, a, a new type of biology, which was to study the, uh, what, what sort of a specialization neutrophils acquire in the tissues and what roles do they have there. But this is the point that we're doing, that we're now looking for the effect of for the uh, presence of neutrophils in tissues, including the bone marrow, which is a bit what I wanted to discuss today. Uh, so this is the model that we proposed. This was also led by, by Maria, also by uh, Jose Angel and, and Jackson. So there was really a lot of work and a lot of people involved. Um, and so we found that most organs are infiltrated, some with a circadian sort of pattern of infiltration, uh, of infiltration, some without an apparent pattern of infiltration, but there was always infiltration in most organs, and we found examples with these, and we are still doing a lot of these, these studies. So this is just one initial uh, example that we did to satisfy the referees, but actually our mind is set in, in doing this a bit more rigorously. So in one example in the lungs was that the presence of neutrophils was controlling the circadian transcription of the tissue as a whole. Uh, so it's not only of, of the cells. So basically the cells are somehow imprinting some sort of uh, circadian program into the cell. So this was very interesting. I won't go into this, but this is something that we're exploring now. And there are other organs like in the, in the intestine where we see a repression of the production of GCSF and this control level marrow. This is just two examples to make the point that, the, the, that, that we were interested in, in the migration of these cells into tissues because now basically we propose that they are doing many other things just than controlling infections or inducing inflammation. So this is um, getting um, closer to the bone marrow, an experiment that we did with, uh, with Maria uh, around 10 years ago um, to show um, that if you um, inject uh, transfer neutrophils 
uh, into the bone marrow, there's an interesting phenomenon that happens. There are two things that happen. First, if you look for GFP positive cells, these are CXL12 GFP animals. Sorry, I didn't indicate this. So GFP positive cells express CXL12, which is the you know the, the big chemokine in the bone marrow, and and is it, it basically identified what we call niche cells, the ones that that Polfnet and others uh, define. So. Anyway, we just get here and what we see is that just by injecting neutrophils, we get a, a, a reduction in the number of, of these cells, a reduction in the amount of CXCL12, modest, but, but very consistent of the chemokine, and at the same time, release of stem cells from the blood into the circulation. So this was interesting because now we saw um, you know, an association uh, between an immune cell and uh, an effect on hematopoiesis and that we can read in two ways, by the, by the stroma or by the, the, the presence of progenitors in the circulation. And we confirm this not by transfer, which is a bit of a dirty experiment, but anyway informative, but also with the parabiosis system to show that if you put a neutrophilic mouse next to a wild type mouse, then you induce the, the release of more stem cells from this mouse. This mouse is normal, but if it's exposed to a neutrophilic mouse, then it, it releases more stem cells. And this requires migration to the bone marrow because if you have a, a mutant for Fukusil transferase, basically these this neutrophils cannot migrate. Animal is neutrophilic, but cannot go anywhere. Or the CXCL4 is specific for neutrophils, so these cells can go everywhere except the bone marrow. Um, then these animals don't develop neutrophilia. So this was sort of the demonstration that somehow Neutrophils go to the bone marrow, one of the many tissues where they go. And one thing that they do is, is they regulate these, these changes in this stroma and the release of, of, of stem cells. And this was very interesting, but absolutely uh, a crazy uh, a, or, and very poorly defined in detail. So this, is, this was the model. This is the aging process, go inside the bone marrow, the macrophages involved here, and somehow this repressed uh, um, these CXL12 producing cells and the stem cells uh, went into the circulation. So the two things, are, of course, that we don't know from this scheme that we published almost 10 years ago is what sort of changes occur in the stromal compartment, what, what the hell is this thing, and, and why do stem cells uh, go into the circulation, which was the, the original question that we had. So this is um, the work that two people, uh, Kanako that I mentioned before and, and uh, Ithier have been doing in the lab. So I wanted to present a little bit. The two are, are uh, work in progress, and I, uh, you know, would, thought it would be interesting for you, but also uh, good for for us to get your feedback. So anyway, how does this crosstalk between neutrophils <coughs> and uh, mesenchymal cells in the bone marrow work? And I'll just show you hints that we have and try to collect everything into a model, and then leave it there. So it just there's to uh, elicit some some questions from from you guys. I like to. In, in the seminars, I like to leave more questions than answer questions. So it's it, then you want to see the second part, like in the movies, uh, whenever there's a second part. So anyway, this is the experiment that we did with, with Kanako. Um, first thing that we did is that we had this idea that the neutrophils, you know, in addition to engaging neutrophils, and because we've been doing work with these cells, and we know that the cells that went to tissues are quite quite a specific, new specific functions. We wanted to know what's different between the cell, the neutrophil that goes into the bone marrow and we know lives around 10 hours there, and the neutrophils that are just freshly produced in the bone marrow. Many of these neutrophils, the bone marrow in mouse humans is about 40, 50% of the cells there are granulocytes that are developing. So there's, there's a lot of um, energetic investment of the body to produce neutrophils constantly. You know, that's another, reason for us to think that this is more important than just uh, chasing uh, bacteria. So we compare the cells that go into the bone marrow from the cells that are produced freshly and uh, newly from the bone marrow, um, just to see what sort of um, functions, predicted functions the cells would gain um, in the travel out to the periphery before they came back home um, to the bone marrow. It's a little bit of, of the way um, we see this. So we compared with, with uh, neutrophils from these mice where um, the they few, um, so they lose, this is uh, um, neutrophil specific depletion of CXCR4. This is important for retention in the bone marrow. So neutrophils mature, they leave the bone marrow, but they cannot go back. And this is the trick. So the cells, the neutrophils that you have in the bone marrow are cells that have never seen the peripheral uh, 
issue. And this was what was interesting for us. And then this other system, which is the opposite, we see the neutrophils, we look for the neutrophils that go from this mouse into this mouse and appear in the bone marrow, where we know that those cells necessarily have come from the circulation, and then compare the transcriptome. And what we were looking was basically to try to describe what was different between these cells. But more importantly, and what caught our eye, is that the signature was generally this this is you know a fraction of the of the of the genes that are differentially expressed. You can see the full list here. It's, it's not very large, but consider that neutrophils are not very uh, active uh, transcribing cells. So this is this is not bad at all. And there's an abundance of inflammation related genes, basically uh, you know, interferon associated and interleukin three. And more interestingly, IL1 beta, which caught our eye because this is a secretive factor. So it's associated with many things, associated with with, with inflammation, inflammation activation, and it's associated with dysfunction of the bone marrow, both with aging and with um, in, in some uh, uh, major proliferative disorders. So IL-1 beta was, was particularly interesting for us, and that's what we are following um, the trail. So um, we did single cell sequencing, and you'll see a, a lot of this as this is becoming cheaper and, and more uh, democratic. So most people can do this, but also there are a lot of resources in the in the um, in the literature and databases. So you can basically do this without doing the experiment, which is very cool. Uh, but anyway, in this case, we did this experiment comparing uh, single cell sequencing of bone marrow neutrophils and blood neutrophils. We wanted to see uh, many other things. Is is what is the progression of, of some of the genes that we uh, that we describe, in particular IL-1 beta. So, I uh, mean, this is just to illustrate um, what you expect. So, um, the transcription factors involved in the differentiation of uh, of uh, the myeloid lineage, like CBP epsilon, is expressed early on in this lineage. Basically, the idea is, is to draw what is the direction of maturation here. C101 has been described to be upregulated as cells go uh, mature and go into the circulation. So clearly, you know, this shows this differentiation pathway. And IL-1 beta, which is the one that I wanted to show here, basically is expressed very late in the bone marrow and is quite high in, in, uh, in peripheral blood. So the idea that this is one of those genes, and they're, they're not that main, but there are a few, that um, go out with maturation and sort of um, become a trademark of the circulating neutrophils. Something, you know, when the cells are in the circulation, we have no idea what or why yet. Uh, but this is one of the genes that lights up when the cells have gone into the circulation and, and probably reflects some uh, experience of the environment out there, perhaps related to the microbiome or part of the normal program. Um, but remember this one aspect, which was one of the, of the genes that that uh, also differentiated the two cells, and that presumably, as these cells go back into the bone marrow, are produced, uh, and the the, uh, the aged neutrophils bring back into the bone marrow. So IL-1 beta uh, would be um, sort of uh, the, the neutrophil would be a little bit like the Trojan horse for IL-1 beta, classical inflammatory cytokine. So this is the prediction with the uh, well. This is the actual uh, the data with transcriptome, and this is the data with proteins. So flow cytometry, you can track IL-1 beta. And here, using the the parabiosis system, we basically use flow um, to compare the non-neutrophil cells. So they have very little IL-1 beta. This is this is cool. Most of the cytokine is in in neutrophils, which are these cells here. These are um, neutrophils from the bone marrow express some amount of IL-1 beta, but this is seen in bulk. So of course, this is the bone marrow is a mixture of, of uh, maturation stages, which is a bit the, the drawback of this. So at least as a, as, a, as a bulk, there's some expression. The ones that go into blood upregulate this, which is consistent with this, with this plot here. And the ones that return back to the bone marrow have an even higher, even if this is not significant, but it's quite consistent, as you can see here. Even uh, higher levels of IL-1 beta. So of course I'm just putting intentions here, but I don't have a clue. Uh, there's uh, some intention of that. This is the model that these cells uh, gather up IL-1 beta on the way back to the bone marrow. And this is just uh, to illustrate how important, at least in terms of, of transcript, the the, uh, the IL-1 beta in the bone marrow uh, is uh, in association with, in association with neutrophils. So these are two models. The CXCF4 mutants that I mentioned before, as the cells mature, they leave the bone marrow. Um, so now if you look for the expression of IL-1 beta in the bulk bone marrow, there's a, a very strong decrease. If you don't have neutrophils, then you have less IL-1 beta. And even more dramatic, if you deplete neutrophils acutely, 
So basically, all neutrophils uh, you can deplete from one day to the next using this um, IDTR inducible system specific for neutrophils, then they all transcript levels of IL-1 beta basically are gone from the hormone. So IL-1 beta is associated with with the influx of, of neutrophils um, into the bone marrow. And the question is, is why and if this is a good target to try to see, again, the, the crosstalk between um, the cells and, and the bone marrow stroma. So this is another experiment that uh, Kanako did. This is based on imaging. Um, so every time there's an excuse, we go to imaging because I think it's, it's very informative and also very visual. Um, so here is what we're looking at again is in, is in uh, one of these parabiosis system where the red cells are coming from the other mouse through the circulation. So that's why we, we use the parabiosis in the system. And in this case, the, the recipient mouse expresses CXL12 QFP. So you see the stroma, um, the, the, the niche type of stroma uh, in green and then vessels in white. And you can see here, these are different, uh, the way this put here is this is closer to this uh, trabecular area and the epiphysis. And as you get farther away like this, the density of neutrophils in red goes down. So they mostly like to go in the same place where hematopoiesis is more active, where there's a lot of uh, bone. And in this area, I'm not showing the quantification, but take my word for this. Um, you see, actually, you can sort of see this, that many, there's, there's, there's not a random distribution of the neutrophils, that most of them like to be around the green cells and the, and the, and the vessels, which, you know, you can, I think you can tell apart by, by the morphology. So this some sort of tropism, so we have the quantification, this, so this is uh, clearly not random, but it's some sort of tropism of the cells that go from the bloodstream, loaded, let's say that they're loaded with IL-1 beta um, into um, the bone marrow, and they like to get close to these mesenchymal cells. So of course, this is not a very specific marker for mesenchymal cells, all, all sort of stromal cells in the bone marrow are very high for this, but I think it, it makes the point that there's, there's an association. So this is actually, yes, this is the quantification to show that they, they, they're closer to these, to the six cells of the vessel than random. So this is the, the way we, we like to plot this. So, um, so this, this uh, made, sorry, this, this um, uh, made the point that was again, and, and connected, tightly connected with another of the major discoveries by, by Paul, which was uh, that mesenchymal and hematopoiesis work together, but mesenchymal um, could also be associated with other cells that regulate the, the bone marrow, in this case, immune cells. And this is something that we and others are doing. But anyway, just to pick up from this other important uh, contribution from Paul. So the experiment um, that Kanako did next is to look, uh, in this case, um, ask what would happen if you deplete neutrophils with uh, the number of mesenchymal cells. So there's a physical association, what happens in terms of number first. Uh, so this is a CFUF assay. You put the cells in culture from the bone marrow and you see how many parolactic colonies form. It's a, it's a way to, to read the, the mesenchymal compartment. And when you deplete neutrophils, they're in the Cree IDTR, the Cree positive um, control, where you induce neutropenia, there's a sharp decrease in the number of, of um, of uh, absolute numbers of these fibroblastic uh, forming units. A lot of this is work in progress, so the ends are low, and I just want to keep it, you know, uh, so, you, so you know that this is work in progress and some of the conclusions are not definitive yet, but this is, seems to be quite robust. And we've been also doing what we think is a quantitatively, quantitatively more rigorous way to do this, which is uh, with limiting dilution assets to estimate the frequency. And again, same thing. Uh, the numbers when you uh, measure like these go from uh, 495 to estimate in four bones, 153. So there's a sharp decrease in the amount of, of mesenchyma measured in numbers. Um, but now this brings us to the other question. Mesenchyma is, 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 a, is a comodin word. Is a, how do you say comodin in, in English? Well, it's a word that you can use for a lot of things where you don't know very sure what you're talking about. You don't know, you know the lineage, but you you know, it's not very specific because the mesenchymal lineage, stromal lineage, uh, you know, can differentiate into a number of different uh, lineages that are relevant for every tissue, including the bone marrow, including osteoblasts and osteocytes, um, uh, chondrocytes, adipocytes, or fat in the, in the marrow, what we call a stroma, which is probably the more immature version of, of these stages, and even myocytes. So, um, you know, this uh, decreasing number, what, what about 
the, uh, the, the fate of this stuff. And now this gets interesting, I think, because you have, and the literature is full of examples where this specialization of the different stromal cells in controlling different types of hematopoiesis, healthy or, 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 um, or, or malignant. Uh, so, for example, osteoblasts associated with lymphocytes, typically. Um, Chondroblasts is more with the forming uh, bones, so it might be more important in the, in, the, uh, in the early stages of life. Adipocytes have been shown to have a negative influence in, in hematopoiesis. And the stroma, what we call stroma, the more uh, stem population has a clearly positive association with, with hematopoiesis. So what are we talking about here? And this is what we're asking now. Um, what sort of targeting? And I'll show you just one example and why we are excited about this. There's a lot of digging that we have to do still, but this is the experiment that we did. We did use three different models of, of uh, two models of neutrophil depletion, the IDTR, acute, the CXCR4, chronic, and now we generated the L1 beta flux specific for neutrophils to see how much of, I, of, of these roles, whatever we found was, was mediated by L1 beta. So again, this is preliminary, this work in progress. Um, but this is what we found basically is uh, we did uh, a CT to measure basically bone density as a river of osteoblastic activity, osteoblastic and osteoclastic, but mostly osteoblastic. And what we find is consistently always, this is the quantification, in some cases not significant yet, so we need to repeat, but the trend is there, a reduction in bone density. So the, the uh, um, osteoblastic lineage that is involved in bone synthesis seems to be Planted on. And this is something I'm not showing here that Canaco is doing in vitro to see really if there's a, a change here. At the same time, this would be the, 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 the bone forming uh, side of the, uh, of, the, of the mesenchyma. At the same time, the amount of fat in the bone marrow, and this seems to be specific to the bone marrow, not to other parts of the body, increases in all the mutants. So this is uh, um, quantified here. Suggesting what we propose from this is that this. Um, Mesenchymal cell is now making decisions um, in part driven by the cells that are coming in, uh, in part neutrophils and IL-1 beta in this case. And this is what, what this experiment shows. And this is what we're um, excited about is um, the cells that need to go out into the periphery, go back into the bone marrow and start telling the, the mesenchymal cells what they should do. Uh, and this is the, the model that um, Kanako proposed basically. Uh, um, this is uh, neutrophil producing IL-1 beta, getting experience out into circulation and driving this fate. So there's, there's more experiments that, that we need to know to understand this. And one of the experiments we're doing with, together with Andres Litzer and taking advantage of, of all the new data sets on, on the uh, stroma single cell level from, from many labs, we're building our own and we're asking what sort of fate decisions the mesenchymal cells are taking in, in, in the different conditions. So do they start really activating pathways of programs that are more um, um, pro-adipogenic and blocking the specific programs that are um, osteogenic and what? This is, this is what we're trying to, to answer now. But the question remains, and I don't know how I'm doing with time, because I don't have a sense of a minute, so I'll, I'll go very quickly, uh, is why do stem cells leave the bone marrow? So I'll just go to the key experiments. So I always have the, the same issue with, with time. So this is what Ethier is doing. Uh, so it's a PhD student is, is now supposed to get, is, is completing this work because this has been submitted and is, is under review now. Uh, so the one experiment I, that we, I think, explains this well is, um, are these circulating stem cells able to um, rescue or regenerate damaged niches? Imagine that you have a specific um, damage um, a trauma or irradiation or a chemical damage uh, to part of your niches so or yes malignant or or a plastic um, um, phenomenon in specific parts of your body and and you know perhaps an idea is that the, the, there's a system of circulation uh, basically serving refilling uh, the the, um, the bone marrow niches throughout the body a little bit uh, yeah like 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 the feeding tract. So the experiment we did to do this was just to deplete hematopoiesis here with partial irradiation in the legs and then wait long enough and see if this would be uh, efficiently regenerated. This is, we're not the first ones to do this, but we wanted to make this proof of concept that there's a kinetic and effective regeneration. So this is ablated and the cells come here and regenerate this quite efficiently. So this is, you know, this could be a very 
uh, likely explanation why we, we need this system. Uh, but of course, this does not rule out that there's some uh, resistant stem cells here that repopulate. So we did repeat the experiment with, with uh, parabions. As I saw you before, this is great to see. You can have a different reporter gene or, or a marker, and you can see the origin of the cells. So we use this trick um, to, to trace how much of hematopoiesis on any related mouse could be coming from, from a partner animal. And depending on the dose that you give, if you give lethal irradiation, then 100% of the hematopoiesis comes from the partner, but this is efficient. So the cells that go through the bloodstream have regenerating potential, long-term multi-lineage, so the canonical definition of stem cells. And this goes down, and they, they require empty niches. If you don't have empty niches, then the recovery is less efficient. So here's the idea that they might be um, this, this um, notion that they might be filling up uh, damaged niches when, when a damage occurs. So another key point I won't go into this for the sake of time is we see that these circulating stem cells are multi-clonal. So there's this idea of clonality, not all the cells, uh, all the cells are exactly the same, um, or they can accumulate specific uh, mutations. And uh, basically a, a part of the uh, hematopoietic system that you have in the circulation comes from one, two, or three clones of stem cells. So are the circulating stem cells just like a dedicated population of clones that, that you know, are specialized in this, or is, is everything fits everything? Every cell, every stem cell can be um, going to the circulation and repopulate. So this experiment doing uh, barcoding with lenteral tracing, and we did this together with Eugenio Montini in, in San Rafael, what tells us is that the, the uh, uh, circulating uh, compartment that we see in the recipient basically is as complex as the one in the donor. What this suggests is that actually you get most of the stem cells that are in the bone marrow at one point or another, um, going to the circulation and can jump into the other animal. This is based on this sort of artificial system, but so far this was the, the, the surprise that there was not a dedicated subset. Everything or most of the stem cells can do this. Um, this is, uh, I'll just go quickly, uh, this is the identification of CXCL1. We look in parasites, what, what chemokines are uh, highly expressed in, in parasites. We found this chemokine. Uh, together with CXL12, not surprisingly, but this chemical was the second one, uh, or the second highest expressed in parasites. So the cells that would control, in theory, the, the income and outcome uh, of migration of the cells from and into the um, into and out of the of the bone marrow. So this population here, and, and this is the, the expression compared with CXL12. So we made a, a mouse to track these cells that produce CXL1 to see if this was a special population. And the, the key point I want to make is that actually these, these cells that express CXL1 appear to be quite distinctively associated with, with vessels, which was quite cool. More than any other lineage that has been described, and not like in the cells, of course, but quite highly. So we define this a little bit as are possibly these portals are these specialized in allowing the cells to live. And this is just to you can idea everybody's studying how the cells go inside the bone marrow into the one they are retained there. So that's of course very important. We don't know how the cells decide to leave the bone marrow. This might be important if you're thinking about leukemic clones or in the context of clonal hematopoiesis, where you don't want the cells to leave because they're going to create trouble. So this is what we're asking. What is the route of, of exit of the bone marrow? These cells that produce XL1, by the way, are also missing chimal cells. And this is, I'll just go very quickly to show that CXL2, which is the receptor for CXL1, just happens to be highly expressed in long-term stem cells, and then the expression goes down, then goes up later in the myeloid lineage, but it's quite distinctively high in, in this lineage. So we identified CXL2, we did experiments to show that CXL2 actually, mutants for CXL2, have less of the circulating um, hematopoietic stem cells, and, and when you do this reconstitution assays in, in the parabiotic system, you see that there's this uh, of this uh, combination. So this is what we propose, that the CXL1, CXL2 axis is mediating this, and the cells live here. And we're interested, we, we're digging more into the implications. So the mechanism, we sort of uh, are happy with what we have so far. There's still things we need to learn. But the, the implications, and what we're looking now is how important is this for these cells to live, not only in health, but also in the context of disease. So I'll just skip this. Wanted to show this experiment because we've done it together with uh, Clara Calina Florian here in, 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 
in Barcelona, and, and I think it's important to make the point, one consequence by looking at the mutants, one consequence of disrupting this, this program, at least by disrupting CXA2, or this program of the cells uh, leaving freely the, the circulation and going into other parts of the bone marrow, is that the cells display a premature aging phenotype. So one um, proposal, this is measured in different ways, either polarization of CC42, or these are related uh, histones, so you know these these models that Carolina has has developed. The idea here is that if you don't have this system, the hematopoiesis, uh, hematopoiesis as a whole, at least the stem cells, so, uh, seem to undergo something similar to premature aging. So the quality, one would think that this is a quality control, so that the best, the fittest stem cells would be able to um, to replenish uh, this. And this is this is the uh, the model. So I'll just finish here. Apologies for the extra time, and uh, I'll be happy to take questions. Thanks very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Andres. It has been great and a great feeling to have a physical presence here, okay, in the in the hall. Uh, I remind uh, the online uh, attendees that they can ask the question using the, the online system. There is a box there to send your questions. Uh, questions, let me take two first for, for me, for people engage. Very general, in fact, <laughs> extremely general. So why the, why hematopoietics themselves and neutrophils, they require the circadian? So why is required that? Yeah, that's a good point. I didn't show the slide. We think about this. Um, to do this, we try at one point we tried to do an experiment with the mutants in the wild. In SPF, all the animals are fine. And that's that, that's the problem that we don't know the true biology. But what I would expect to answer your question, if you take these mutants, I have the CXCR4 always has a lot of these age, the, um, uh, daytime type of neutrophils and the um BMAL mutants, they always have very low numbers of these. So the two extremes. They they represent the daytime and the nighttime extremes of these. Um, so these animals are fine in SPF, and the experiment I wanted to do is to put them in the wild, in the wild, in a contained area where they would get uh, uh, infected and, you know, exposed to anything, to bad diet or to whatever it is. The prediction is in a different, that is completely system to what we're studying in our animal facilities, is that the CXCR4 mutants would be uh, doing great against infections. But they would have uh, uh, frequent uh, thrombotic events. I'm not going to say heart attacks because that's difficult in mice, but they would have both thrombotic events because they are always on a high alert state. Inflammation is, is the trait, intravascular inflammation. And the BMAN mutants probably would be fine and protected from this like any other mouse, uh, but occasionally they would succumb for two infections more than, than your typical water mouse. The reason is that they cannot couple their activity with a uh, moving. I'm likely to get infected. Uh, oh, that's trouble. Uh, so for that, the, the mutant with uh, always a daytime uh, or the, you know that phenotype of activity is great. When you go to sleep, perhaps the platelets or, or the other systems that control the quality and the cleaning of the system, they're not as happy. You're more likely to to go into a, a, a sterile inflammation. Yeah. It's a trade-off. So that's the idea. In fact, just a curiosity. In 2009, we published and was the cover of Cancer Research that BML1 is silenced in cell leukemia and lymphoma. It's not expressed by DNA methylation. Some cell leukemia and lymphoma, they do not follow at all circadian rules. Right. Leukemia and lymphoma cells. Right. So maybe at this relates, you mentioned, 2009. It controls a lot of factors of metabolism and it also uh, canonical transcription factors. The, the question is always there with the reviews. How much of this yeah. circadian have? So you have to do circadian experiment. But the guess is because we might have adapted a lot of things. It integrates the immune, it integrates uh, um, ATP production, other aspects of metabolism, growth, proliferation. Uh, you pick, you know, it's a system that is very nice to go up because then you can touch a lot of things at the same time. And even a more general question. At the beginning, only the brain was circadian. Now all tissues, are they follow circadian rules? Right. So uh, Salva Nari is doing a lot of work on this and he's shown that it's, it's, it's uh, tissue in a couple of tissues, in the liver and the skin, but there's more things coming. Um, each one has its own uh, clue. So this, the brain coordinates everything, but in his model where the brain is BMAL knockout, everybody's BMAL knockout, but he refers to his expression in specific tissues. That tissue has not, is not, the animal is still not normal, but that tissue starts being circadian. And the question is how do you, how does, I, I 
you know, yeah. it's very crazy. How does the skin, for example, or the, or the liver yeah. know when it's day or night? How do they, does, the, does the skin have eyes? That's, that's, I leave that there. <laughs> Thank you, Andres. Questions from the audience? Beautiful talk. So I, I was very intrigued about these hematopoietic stem cells living, you know, on top of blood vessels. And I have a few questions, I mean, totally naive, because I don't know much about it, but is, do they, so are they connected to the endothelium with junctions? And in which type of vessels they are? And they like, because the way that you depicted them, they look like pericytes. Do they live in cells which are pericyte naked? Do they interact with pericytes? I mean, yeah, that's 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 a question. Um, I'm not I'm not the 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 right person to ask this because I look that from a more um, uh, impassionate view. But uh, you know, um, I find this or Daniel Lucas, people who do this for a living, could tell you the canonical tight interaction is not so much with vessels, but with the stroma, perivascular cells, because that's the first thing they see. Naked um, vessels, in the more like you would see it, endothelium directly contacting with endothelium. I think that's rare for what I've seen. Uh, so more of the contacts are through um, uh, or more of the relevant vessels in the bone marrow, to put it in a different way. Have a, a set of perivascular cells. This could be uh, megakaryocytes. This could be um, different types of pericytes or mural cells that are around those or so leptin receptors seem to control a different type of stem cells with specific uh, preferences. In those cases, I don't think there's been any connection type of so tight junction related uh, um, associations. The stroma uh, between itself or between the different stromal cells, yes. So it, it, it really is a network. I don't show it in the image here, but uh, Cesar Nombella has been doing a lot of this, uh, the, the son of Cesar Nombella, Nombella Rita, has been doing a lot of this. Um, this is, he describes really tight networks and this is really fascinating, which and Jose Cancelas suggests that these are, you know, um, for me, some sort of synthesia, so they can share information, uh, but not as far as I know uh, between the stem cells. And, and... Yes, very nice talk. Um, so it's it's very interesting. These neutrophils going back to the bone marrow and IL one beta driving uh, the communication with other cells. So do you know? Which signals, because I understand that's pro IL1 beta, so which signals are driving the processing of that IL1 beta into bioactive form? And if you know which, from right. which cells are those signals or right. how's it happen? No idea. We haven't measured active IL1 beta, so all this is based on, on the genetic model. And we've tried to measure. Um, it's not easy also because the amounts are, are, are uh, small. And I think Laura Calvi. I did measure in, in, in her model, it was macrophages that produced this, and this is always the problem. You choose your favorite cell and then that cell uh, does everything, but this is not what we find here. Um, it could be anything. So the second hit to activate, for example, cast bases, as it shows, um, could be, I mean, this is just very speculative ideas. The neutrophil has received the second hit in the periphery and is ready to go. Like we just don't know we would need to measure cast space. Um, the other idea is that eventually, if there's a very large number of neutrophils out in the um, that go back, we're talking millions still. I mean, there, there are many, many neutrophils all together in the bone marrow, but the ones that come back, there's a significant number. Some of those could be dying and releasing these this net type of structures that, that you know we study so much in in, um, in inflammation, and those are uh, also providing alarm signals. So this is purely speculative. We have not found those structures yet because we have not looked for them. I don't think there would be a shortage of, of, uh, of potential signals. We don't know the nature of them. Maybe maybe death, or maybe they, like I say, maybe they just prefer them. We don't know. So that that's a link. This is all genetic at this point. There's a lot of data sharing IL-1 uh, with uh, biases in myelopoiesis, so I think this is very clear that there's active IL-1 um, signaling in the bone marrow. But the protein you're right is something that is still a bit out there. How is that produced? Yeah, so this is uh, related to the first question that I asked and the experiment that you are proposing. So have you tried, so this neutrophil circadian rhythm and the function forming in the bone marrow how is it affected by inflammation? So have you tried to add LPS to your mice and do something? I don't know, this is related to the, this 
emergency if not by this field. No? And I mm. Right, right, to, right. So yeah, pr probably the idea is that everything will change because you accelerate this, you um, uh, export part of the uh, ethanol process to the spleen, uh, the cells would be different. But this very obvious experiment, unfortunately, we, we just don't have time. We're trying to figure out how this is in normal conditions. We just haven't had time to do the obvious things, um, both in periphery or in the bone marrow. In periphery, I can tell you, because I think this is interesting. When you um, induce um, high degree inflammation, you get a lot of uh, um, inflammation and neutrophilia in the context of uh, high fat diet even, which messes, us, messes up everything. In, those, in that system, it was interesting to see that the number of cells is, is very much elevated and this has been known for years, but they still follow very strict circadian patterns. It says that the amplitude of the, of the, um, of the, uh, of the curve of the oscillation is much, is much bigger. And why and how, I think, I think that's fascinating, but this an oscillation for like 10 years ago, and, and seriously, it, it, it's just we don't have time to answer these very important questions. When we come down this system, what is it controlling the bone marrow? It might be that might become relevant because it might be just a system, an alert system that is in place already. And for example, pulling out that question, this might be a hit that you have the cells producing what they need to produce. The moment that you hit with this, then you change the program because IL-1 beta is, is already there. Um, again, we, we more in the mechanisms and, and why you have such a, um, um, twisted system, why, you know, it's, it's difficult for me, to, for me to envision, but I think it's important now that we will have the models to see what is the physiology of the bone marrow or in models of disease when you don't have this, this at play. So I, it, that's a, the best question I can give to this. Last question, Lucas. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk, that's very nice. I was uh, wondering, I think that in one experiment, you show a, an animal that uh, has a neutrophils that are resident only in the bone marrow, isn't it? Uh, that are resident in the yeah. bone marrow? Yeah. yeah. Are, in, I mean, that animal also has uh, circulating neutrophils or are exclusively resident in the bone marrow? I'm not very sure which experiment. I don't know if so, I... So, uh, it was a control in, with a kind of a blue mouse. Let me, let me show you, so you can point. To, is this um, is this yeah, that one here? Mm, no, no, in the in the six or four mutant, you mean? Uh, that one, the eighteen. The eighteen. The one, yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. So, yeah, yeah. I was wondering if the other uh, the other way around can be done. I mean, can you generate an, uh, an animal uh, with neutrophils that do not go to the bone marrow? Yeah. Um, and yeah, see this, if that impacts on the hematopoietic stem cell maturation, the mesenchymal. Yeah, that, that, that would be great. This is a great model for this. The problem is that it, it has subnormal granulopus to start with. This, this says that they go, everything is normal in the periphery, but they leave too early and they can never come back. And it's an all or nothing. One of those few examples in biology with this is one receptor, one function. So you, you get, um, so one system we need to combine I'm thinking. We we thought about it sometimes. We haven't done it because it was it seemed a bit too twisted, but it could work. Um, uh, to combine these with with parabiosis, so the animal that you're studying, I don't know, it could be in a neutrophilic mouse or something like this. Um, uh, the partner animal, this one, would send neutrophils everywhere, so the animal would be immunocompetent, except the bone marrow. That that could be a system where you could kind of. where you could. And your idea is. is then uh, use that system to, to study exactly what, to explore they, the, the function. I mean, if that affects the hematopoietic stem cell maturation or the mesenchymal stem yeah, cells, yeah, yeah. No, or that, even the the bone the density, that's right. That's no, that, beautiful. That's a good point here. Um, it is a bit a point, a bit uh, alone. I think what you're saying. Uh, this is this is this mouse here. The MR4 is this one here. Um, and yeah, it makes the point that whatever happens in the wild type does not happen in this. In this animal, so then, yeah, that, that would be a good system to explore. Thank you. Thank you. Many more questions, but in the interest of time, we will finish. Thank yep. You. Thank you.